Good morning, or good afternoon, are we on? Um, Eric, thank you for coming and doing this uh, taping, and I, I appreciate Wes coming, and, and he's uh, uh, generous. This is a work day for him, and uh, I, I, I know he'd love to go home and, and uh, have some family time. I appreciate that to, uh, to Wes. I just want to quickly, just co quickly go over, uh, as we always do, and um, that is the prayer time. So folks, if you've, got, um, if you've got a pencil and a sheet of paper, or if you have the prayer, um, the, the prayer uh, that we get in Wednesdays in the, af in the evening, um, you'll probably find some names in there as well. I've got some names here as well. Um, I'm thinking of Linda and Dave, especially Linda. Uh, she's suffering right now. She fell um, maybe a day or two ago, and I'm not sure if, uh, Wes, if you know anything about that or... Um, she's pretty bruised up. Yeah. Um, I think she's doing okay, but they're okay. one thing after another with those two. Okay. Um, also remember John Simmons. He had some stints put in. He had uh, two more stints put in on this last Monday. And then a couple of days before that, he had some stints put in. So he's had some and he feels very good. I called him up this morning and he's doing great. Also remember um, um, Art Polly. He's always uh, on my prayer uh, list, although he's he's feeling about normal, so that's great. I'm glad to hear that. Also, remember Scott Gamble. He doesn't go to our church, but he is a man that used to go to our church, and he's a wonderful Christian man. He just uh, he loves the people of Boyd. He he talks about them uh, quite a bit. I don't know if there's any more. Uh, Wes, are, am I missing some? I don't have any names in particular. Okay. I just want to take just a second, though, to encourage, since we aren't meeting as we typically would, uh, the opportunity to hear these prayer requests haven't, haven't come in as, as frequently and as prevalently as they might have otherwise. But if you're, if you're out of work or something at home and you're struggling and you, you're having a tough time heating your house or putting food on your table or, or whatever it might be that your struggle is, uh, the, the body exists to um, a lot of things, but to support one another. And so I just would encourage you to, to reach out to myself, to Ed, to your deacon. Um, and if you don't know who that is, call us so that we can tell you who that is. Um, so that if there is a need and you are struggling and you need prayer or you need, you need, you need some sustenance of some kind, please reach out and, and, and get in touch with us so that we can do what we can as the body to, to support one another. Very true. Thank you, Wes. Uh, Wes, would you lead us in a word of prayer? Sure, sure. Father God, we just thank you for the opportunity to gather in your name with your word and the power and the strength that it contains. And I just lift up these names uh, that we have mentioned to you, Father, and, and the others, Lord, whose names we don't know, but you know. You know the needs, Father, and, and none of this surprises you when you are powerful and sovereign to meet all these needs. And we just place our, our faith and our trust and our hope in you, Lord, and I just ask that you would enable us as the body to be more than... Um, if ever we were, Lord, to be more than just a building today, Lord, but be a church that's out there in the community, um, serving people, loving people, Lord, uh, meeting needs uh, where the needs are, Lord, that you, ultimately that you would be glorified, Father, and people would come to know the hope and the, and the peace and the security and all these things that those who know you and have a relationship with you already know. We love you, Lord. I pray that you would speak through the word to those who would listen this morning, that you enable um, Jim and I, Lord, to, to teach, Father, that the power of your word would be evident in lives and change lives, Lord. We love you and ask these things in the name of your Son, our King and Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen. Uh, if you would be so kind as to open your Bibles to the sixth chapter in the book of Romans, sixth chapter in the book of Romans, before we do that, I want to read you something that might be kind of uplifting to you. I want you to imagine if you would, a stadium. I want you to imagine a, a, um, a contest, that type of situation. Satan says this, I will, I will cause anxiety. I will cause fear. I will cause panic. By the way, this has nothing to do with our lesson today, but I will, sh I will, um, 
I will shut down businesses, I will shut down schools, I will shut down places of worship, I will shut down sports events, I will cease and I will cause financial turmoil. Interesting comment, Jesus comes, this is a contest rather, Jesus says, I will bring together neighborhoods. I will restore the family unit. I will bring dinner back to the kitchen. I will help people slow down their lives and appreciate what really matters. I will teach my children to rely on me and not the world. I will teach my children to trust me and not their money and material resources. You know who wrote this? C.S. Lewis in the year 1942. That's really, that's really powerful stuff. I want you to turn with me to the book of um, Romans, the sixth chapter. I have many, many things to tell you today, and, and so does Wes. Mm -hmm. But I want, to, I, I want to tell you that today we're going to be talking about a couple of things, but one of the things that is really remarkable in this whole thing is that we have the freedom to not live in sin. I can remember my own life, the idea of the freedom that I had to do whatever I wanted to. I had the freedom to go to Iowa and visit a friend of mine. I had the freedom of, uh, when I was a high school kid, I had the freedom to do this and freedom to do that. But that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about the freedom to not live in sin. Remember that we don't live in this world. Listen to this. Do not love this world or the things in this world. If anyone loved the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. Also, in Philippians 3.20, it says our citizenship is in heaven. We do not have citizenship here. I, I know that these are hard, hard times, but this business about freedom to not sin, that we, we live in that. I want you to think for a moment, God's providing righteousness involves more. Uh, this is just kind of an introduction in a little bit. Um, provides more than just declaring me a righteous man on the basis of my faith. He gives me his righteousness, he gives me his faith. The presence of the Holy Spirit within me and God's love within me speak of a new nature, a new life. The sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and the new life is discussed today. Last week, we talked about justification, the change of a man's moral nature. Every justified believer, everyone that is born again is changed. Titus says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, we talked a lot about last week, a lot about hope, and that's great. Today, we might even talk a little bit about mortification, the idea of the, the killing of sin, the idea of doing away with sin. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But, if the spirit, but by the spirit, you put the death put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Colossians 3, 5 says, therefore put to death your members which are on this earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desires and covetousness, which is idolatry. And then think on pride, do away with that. I want to <clears throat> share with you uh, one of the words that I want to bring to you, and I'm not a word man, I'm really not, but, but Paul's the guy that brings it up, not me. So I'll, I, I have to be faithful to that. My father was a man who was born in 1914, and, and, and I heard Wes talk about his dad one time, what a man he was and what a relationship he had. But I, I think about 1914 when my father uh, was born, and then he got married in 1939, and he was a farmer, and I was a farmer's son. And um, 
my father would my father would receive the prayers of my mother daily every day my father was a good man but he was not a christian my grandmother prayed for her son and he never he never came to Christ until the year 1967. I remember that well. I was underneath the table. We were all, we were all kind of visiting, and I just, and all of a sudden, Dad uh, broke down, and he, 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 he had some things to tell us. But I want to tell you that at that time, I didn't become a Christian until 1973. Dad in 1967, myself in 1963, in 1960, and Dad in 1967, myself in 1973. What I want to tell you here very quickly is that I saw some things happen in my dad's life that will coincide with what we're talking about here today. It will coincide because my father, it wasn't just the justification, it wasn't just the reconciliation, it wasn't just all of that. It had to do with something that God was working in him and sanctifying him, sanctifying him. I saw it in the 90s. I saw it where he was sanctifying him from sin, but it also sanctifying him to himself and to, to, to righteousness. Very, very important. Today, God moves from demonstrating doctrine of justification, God's declaring the believer sinner righteous and just, to demonstrating the practical side. My friends, as you're watching this, there's a practical side to all of this of salvation. On those who have been justified, he specifically discusses sanctification being set apart, being holy. If you remember Moses, he writes in the book of Leviticus in the 19th chapter, he says, be ye holy as I am holy. I want my people to be holy and producing righteousness. I want this righteousness to reside in each believer. I saw a woman yesterday. She's my mail lady. She delivers my mail. And I just went down, and she's a young woman, and I just walked down, and I, it was, it was 12.30 in the afternoon, and I said, how are you doing today? I mean, I don't know her from Adam. I don't know her from anybody, and she doesn't know me. But I said, how are you doing? And she says, oh, I'm just living the life. You know, and here she is. Uh, she's a, a male lady, meaning it was sarcastic. I'm just living the life. Listen, we are living the life. Uh, we're living the life of the Christian. I have some things that I want to tell you. Um, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, all of that. All of that, I just read you that. But I want to also tell you, because of the Pharisaic background that Paul has, he has that, and he anticipates the argument. He knows before he even brings this verse up, this first verse. He knows that by preaching justification based on grace, which he does, we get our justification by grace. We get our righteousness by faith. Paul was encouraging the people to sin. He was telling people to sin. That's what people thought. If our unrighteousness demonstrates, here's the argument, folks, if you're listening, if our, if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? If the truth of God has increased throughout my life, it does not matter how people live. It doesn't matter how I live. I can sin all I want, and God's grace is going to cover it. The gospel promotes lawlessness. That's what, he, that's what the people were saying. But Paul, if salvation is of grace and justification is of faith, I can continue in sin. That's what they're saying. I can continue to keep sinning as a believer. And Paul says, certainly not. Now, I anticipated 
an argument years ago. I was in graduate school. I was going, I was doing something. I, we were in Lincoln, Nebraska. My wife was working on an optometrist. We had no money, no money. We didn't have money. We barely had money to get groceries. And I was out playing golf. And my wife was working hard. I didn't have classes that day. And my wife was working hard. I anticipated the argument. I knew very good and well that she was going to come home and she blasted me. It's true, she blasted me, just like, just like Paul. She said this, Certainly not, Jim. It's not a matter of you being able to go and play golf anymore. But listen, I'm working hard every day so you can go get this bloody, this bloody degree. Certainly not, Jim. I'd rather not. I'd rather not you have to do this. May it never be. This is the reason why Paul says what he said. He said these things, and this is the reason. Listen to what I'm going to tell you. This is not in Scripture. Death and life are not compatible. To be a Christian means to have died to sin. When I became a Christian, I died to sin. I was buried with Christ. And when I became a Christian and I rose, from the dead, and I forever live with Christ, even here, not just in heaven, but even here. It says here, therefore, it is a moral contradiction for a Christian to still be living in sin to which he has died. My friends, each one of you that are watching, you have died to sin. You cannot live in sin. You cannot. It's a moral contradiction. I'm telling you that. Died to sin ties this death to Christ. If you've died to sin, you've, you've put him at the cross. Specifically, this happened at salvation. This is a positional truth. I can't tell you more than that, but I'm, I'm telling you, we have no excuse for, for living. Uh, um, death and life are, are, are not compatible. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give uh, Wesley uh, some time here. Uh, Wesley, if you have some things that you'd like to say. I just have much, I mean, your notes are pretty much parallel to what I have to say uh, in that Paul has, as a, as a um, he saw this argument from the Jews coming. He, he's already argued, he's already made this defense one time back in chapter 3 when he's addressing his own people, the Jews, because they are, as we remember, they're very legalistic, right? They've been under the law for a long time. And so they see, so they see Paul's idea of grace as a threat to the law, as something that's going to come against the law, and they're worried about it diminishing the law. And so Jim brings this argument that is brought against Paul, and, they, and he says, you know, if we give these people this grace, well, they're just going to keep sinning. They're just going to take this as an opportunity for license to keep sinning. And Paul, he refutes this in the most absolute terms. And in the commentaries I read, they say that, Paul uses this certainly not, absolutely not, as about the most forceful way to repudiate the arguments that are being brought against them as, as it exists in the Greek. And, he's, and again, he uses it multiple times throughout the book of Romans. Um, but uh, so we get into the idea, just like Jim, by way of introduction, said, we're going to talk about justification. Or we're not going to be, we've finished talking about justification. We're now on to sanctification, which is a lifelong process. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning of that argument, Paul starts with the fact that sin has no more power. And that's, that's kind of where we pick up the, yeah. the, the, the story today, yeah. the letter. Thank you, Wes. Um, if we go then to the third verse, it, it says, and I'm just going to keep on moving right along. Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Wonderful, wonderful verse. In baptism, I'm thinking this is Christian baptism, it's not water baptism, because we're gonna see some things. Number one, water baptism does not save. However, Christian baptism, spiritually immer immersed. I'm spiritually immersed. You were spiritually immersed in Christ by faith. 
Look at Galatians 3.27, write that down. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Look at 1 Peter 3.21. There is also an antitype, it says, which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He saved me to a good conscience. He saved me to a, um, that, um, the answer of a good conscience, what he's talking about. The question is, um, does this refer to water baptism or spirit baptism? I believe it's, it's, it's spirit baptism. Um, I'm going to read you another verse. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Into his death, my friends, immersed in his death and his resurrection. Into his death, immersed in his death and his resurrection. Then I go quickly to, to verse number four. And it says this, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. My goodness gracious, be buried with Christ through the baptism of death. To be raised with Christ and walk in newness of life. One of the best jobs of my whole life was a very simple job. I was a bedpan jockey. I cleaned bedpans. I cleaned bedpans. I, I cleaned men who messed themselves. I shaved them. I did all that kind of stuff. Uh, for, for two years I did this. And there was a... Um, I, I, I had a ward of 10, 12 men and I took care of them and by 3.30 I left and went home. But by six o'clock, I was there again, and I, I helped them. But I want to tell you that uh, this business about walking in the newness of life, you might ask the question, what is, what does that feel like, walking in the newness of life? Listen, I was with Adolf. He was an old man, 80 years old. He was going to get his cast off today. And the doctor came up on this day, and he says, Adolf, are you ready to get the cast off? And Adolf said, yeah, I am. And the doctor pulled the saw out and zip. And he took, he took the, the, uh, the legging off. And he asked him, are you ready to stand up? And I stood on his one side, and the doctor stood on his other side, and we stood him up. He had not walked in a year. And he stood, and you know what? It was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I, I don't know why I remember that, but it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I went home at 3.30. He never sat down that whole day. He walked the halls. This was like the newness of life. It was like he never... It was like he couldn't express how beautiful this was. I came the next day, and he just felt wonderful. I'm telling you to be raised with Christ and walk in the newness of life. That's what this is. Walking a new life with Christ. Not the old where we've been buried, but walking with new, this, this newness of life. To be raised up with him. And then united with Christ, regenerated of the believer, I will give you a new heart. Now this is united with Christ. This is uh, this is uh, uh, um, uh, this is uh, the regeneration of the believer. New heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and put a new heart of flesh in it. That has to do with Ezekiel 36, 26. This united means very simply, I'm gonna let Wes talk here in a little bit, but this united that we're talking about in the fifth verse, for if we have been united with Christ together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be united in the likeness of his resurrection. 
My wife and I bought our house in 1988. We moved in. In 1989, we started to work on the, in the, in, in the, uh, well, it, it was kind of in the fall of the year when we, when we started to work on it. And I didn't even go hunting that year. I just helped Joyce and Joyce helped me. I, one of my big jobs was digging holes to put trees in. And that's what we have today. We have, we have many, many trees. But it got to the point where the fall was almost over and the rain was coming and it was sleet. And it took like an hour to do one hole. Well, I did a hundred holes. It just took forever. It just took weeks. And finally, the rain was coming and, we, and Joyce and I were so tired and we looked at each other and I said, Joyce, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna dig the hole. And I was looking, I had one tree, beautiful one, maybe about like that. And then I had one small tree, maybe like that. And I did not feel like digging a hole for an hour's worth just for that one. So I combined the two. I put them both in the same hole. That was in 1989, 2009, sometime in there, 2010, I saw that tree and I wondered, gosh, that looks, well, there's two trees in there. I mean, and, it, and they were united. They, they grew together. It was just beautiful. I, I, I can't believe it. If I would have put that tree by itself, that little one, it would have died. So this was really quite something. United in the likeness of Christ. United in the likeness of his death. United in the likeness of his resurrection. That is, that's a beautiful little story. The planting, uh, planting in the same hole. Wes, I don't know if you have anything. Just quickly on this idea of baptism. Um, <clears throat> I'm, with, I'm in agreement with Jim that we're talking about spiritual baptism there in verse 4 and, and through 6. Um, but one thing that I think, I think of the setting we would typically be in on the Sunday morning and the things we would discuss with the people that are there. And, and while it is, I do believe that it's spiritual baptism, the New Testament doesn't understand a, a born-again believer apart from water baptism. Um, if we look through uh, Acts especially, we can see multiple times um, where we Good have point. the believers that are, that are, um, that have been, you know, Cornelius was saved first, but then he was baptized immediately afterwards. Paul was, had the scales removed from his eyes from Ananias and he believed and then he was baptized immediately afterwards. Lydia in Acts 10 believes and was baptized immediately afterwards. So right. as, as we're talking about it being in an adult uh, Sunday school class, I've known people who would be saved Who've, who've been spiritually regenerated and will go to heaven and be with Jesus, and there's no doubt in my mind or theirs. But when Paul talks about how he uses this illustration of baptism, and we think about water baptism, I, I wonder when Jesus says to make disciples go and be baptized, and we refrain from doing that, we rob ourselves of the opportunity to identify with the power of what Paul is talking about to the Romans here. And so I would just encourage you, if you're out there listening and you've been spiritually regenerated and you know who Jesus is, and Jesus tells you to go and be baptized, what's, what's holding you back from being baptized? That you might understand yeah. the power of what Paul's saying. Not that you won't go to heaven, because that's not true. Baptism is only a picture of what actually happens. But I wonder what happens to us, especially as adults, when we're dunked in the water and we, re we recognize that I am being as a likeness of the death that Jesus died to sin that we're talking about here this morning, mm -hmm. and then we're regenerated, how we understand what that looks like and what that feels like in, in the water baptism. Not, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ordinance, it's not a saving thing, but I ask you, why would you deny yourself that thing which Jesus commands you to do here? Yeah. Agreed. Thank you, Wes, that's a good point, good point. Um, this is, I'm sure, where, uh, where a lot of you in, um, that are watching have questions, and, and uh, you can sure write them down. You can ask Wes when you see him, um, and, uh, or a uh, uh, ask me as well. But uh, thank you, Wes. And now we come to the sixth verse. Now, you know, 
we're, we're coming to this point. I'm going to try to, it's already quarter after uh, five. Um, knowing this, uh, knowing this, it, it, and that basically says, I have the confidence, I have in confidence uh, that the, the body of the sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, this is verse number 10, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. So those are those six through 10. I'll just tell you that um, those are wonderful, wonderful verses. And uh, Paul says, having confidence, he's talking about the ungenerated, the unregenerated man, the old man. He talks about it not only here, but in other, verse, in other books as well. It has nothing to do with something that is old in years, but it has something to do with something that is useless. Uh, we might use the same terminology for law, which is law, the law is perfect. I don't want to tell you that it's not, but it is useless in the sense that Christ came and fulfilled the law. And so um, the old self, here he talks about the old self died, the new life of Christ. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The body of sin, of course, is that is the same as the old man that it talks about in the in the sixth in the sixth word. I don't know if if Wes wants to jump in here. Anything that you want to say? I just love the idea of uh, and I, I, we see here that we talk about the crucifixion of the old man and the new man is here now. I think it's it's important for us to recognize that it's not a it's not a resuscitation of us as believers, but it's a resurrection of us as believers. Yeah. Not that. You know, we, we look at, and I know a lot of people in Wyoming, you know, we're self-sufficient, we do things ourselves, we're big remodelers, right? We wanna go take our house and we wanna turn it into what we want it to look like. Well, this isn't a remodel job on me as Wesley Avent. This is a demolition job on me as Wesley Avent. True. And a pallet where, where the demolition has taken place and the dirt is scraped away, there is a palace that stands there now because of the work that Christ has done where it was just an old ramshackle woodshed before. We need to understand that, and, when we th and you may be even confused now that uh, talking about this death to sin, what does that look like? How does that happen? It's not that we are different that we're better than we were we are completely new creatures than we were before paul says in in second corinthians 5 17 if i can find it, it there there if anyone is in christ he is a new creature the old things passed away behold new things have come when we talk about the old man dying that's what paul means he's mean that you ain't the same as you were before spiritually we are new creatures in Christ. It's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. In that eighth verse, I wanted to just hit one little thing here to you or with you, and that is now, if, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. I don't want you, I don't want to leave you with the idea that that's something that's going to be an eternal truth. We will live with him here, even today. Um, it's a it's a positional thing. I, 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 I don't deserve it, but I, I live for him, and, and uh, it's not only an eternity, but here also. In the ninth verse, Christ died once and for all. That's one of the great things. He died once in the tenth verse. In the tenth uh, verse, he says, never to be repeated. I'm going to read you something, um, and that is this. Um, having been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. That's Hebrews 10.10. 10. I'm gonna read you Hebrews 7, 26 and 27. For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. And 
even though the high priest daily would offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, then for the people's, for this he did once and for all, Christ, and he offered up himself. I remember reading many times about uh, Aaron as he goes in and he offers up for his family, first of all, and then he offers up for his people. And it's a tremendous sacrifice that he does. Christ does, and he do this every year. Christ does this once, mm. and his sacrifice is once. Mm. It's a wonderful thing. Um, uh, in the 11th verse, um, there is one uh, word, and I, 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 it's, it's not a big deal, but likewise you also reckon yourselves, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I wanted to let you know that this business about reckoning, it's a matter of to count or to number. We think about the old time Western man. Well, have you, did you, did you kill, did you kill your neighbor? And he says, well, I reckon I did. Uh, and so it's sort of like, it's, it's not like that, but to count or to number, it's an absolute confidence in what I know to be true. I reckon, I know, I have an absolute confidence of what Christ has done for me, that I should live, that my actions and my deci decisions are always affected. Everything that I do, what I know of Christ, this lesson here, all these things, I know they affect my decisions and they affect my actions. I hope they do. How can the new self how can the new self be dominant? The old man, the new man, I just can't get my old man to... Listen, you reckon the old man dead to sin, but you reckon me to be alive, the new man, the new man, that is to live to Christ. Okay. Uh, Wes, do you have anything to say on any of those before we quit? Yeah, on the, on the whole reckoning thing is just is the word I picked out too, and yeah. and uh, it's like a it's like a, a term that like imputed or it's reckoned to you. But I think I think and I think maybe when we read this this whole idea of being dead to sin because we know how we still live and we still struggle, it's yeah. it's confusing to us. And I think when we read that verse eleven, we need to understand that Paul is not giving teaching here so much as he's telling these people, this is what to do. This is what happened when, when Jesus Christ justified you. You were made dead to sin. I don't know that you understand it or even that you recognize it, but I'm telling you that this is the truth. And so because I'm telling you, you need to live that way. You need to do the things that a man who was dead to sin would do. And you may not even understand what that looks like right now, but I'm telling you, reckon yourself as dead to sin and live that way. And, it's, and I think we as believers even today need to under, take that as a command from Paul and say, okay, I know I'm saved by, by grace through faith in, in Christ Jesus. I need to live that way. And, and in, in the following verses, um, Paul tries to help us get an idea of, of more about what that really looks like. But it's, just a, it's a command that we need to, uh, need to obey if we know Jesus, um, even if we don't really recognize what it means to be dead to sin. Yeah, very true, very true. Uh, here is, let's just finish this up here. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. But that's the, those are the last three verses, I would say, in verse number 12, the only, repository and the only dumpster that we have is our body. That's the only vulnerable spot that the sins will go. And I, I just want you to know that, that um, that's the old man and, uh, and the sins. All the, uh, I, re I read some verses um, or some things that had to do with the, uh, the sins of, and, and they're the things that I, I would do. I mean, when I was, when I was a, a, a non-believer. Um, 
uh, sin should not be my master today. Should not be. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 56, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. And so I, I, I want to tell you that I'm, uh, and you are righteous, you're justified, you're reconciled, you're sanctified. All of these things are free. They're given to you. You didn't earn them, not on your merit. It certainly wasn't on my merit. I'll tell you that. Wes, do you want to end, uh, do you want to say anything here yeah. as we quit? Yeah, so, so we've talked about this letter from Paul to the Romans as being heavy, heavy with doctrine. And, and in order to, to as by way of application here, I just want to say, um, you know, you may be asking questions as we wrestle with this idea of being dead to sin. You know, mm -hmm. I am born again, but I still struggle with sin. So how yeah. can I be dead with sin, dead, dead to sin and still struggle with sin? Um, my flesh is still tempted. I still lust. What are you talking about being dead to sin? And I want to tell you, while outside of a relationship with Jesus, before trusting him with your life, whenever you engaged in sin, whether it was lying or gossiping or cheating on our taxes, we knew it was wrong, right? You, and the, we know it's wrong. I mean, even, especially in the first few times when you try something that's a sin and you know it's a sin, you're convicted, now, the longer we do these things, uh, Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, our, our consciences will be seared if we continue to do these things. And we, we read different scriptures about uh, mm -hmm. being turned over to a depraved mind. That's what happens when we continue in sin. But, but when you sin, here and there, we recognize that it's wrong. But while you recognize these things were wrong outside of a relationship with Jesus... You were, you were powerless to stop them. You were a, you were a slave of, of sin without Christ. But now in Christ, we, right, we're, we've been justified, we're be, we've been regenerated, we're talking about being dead to sin, but I'm still in my own strength and effort powerless to stop these things from happening. I can hate the things that I do, and I still struggle to, to stop them. But now, that we're in a relationship with Jesus, we have the opportunity and the knowledge that if and the, and the call and the, and, the, and the command to take those things and give them to Jesus. Without Jesus, we can't be dead to sin because we got no, we got nowhere else to go. We're consumed with sin. We live for ourselves. Yeah. We're worried about myself and myself only. But now that I've got Jesus and he commands me to take these things that I sin, that I struggle with, I can, I've got somewhere to put them. And in relationship with him, we have understanding of why these things we always knew to be wrong are, are wrong. Outside of Jesus, sin doesn't make any sense. Who cares? If, if it's, you know, shake it if it feels good. That's, that's, the, that's the way of an unbeliever, right? We have to, we can't, we can't, I can't even be mad at the unbeliever for that because in, the, in their flesh without Christ, what else can they do? But now we can be dead, we can be dead to sin. We're called to be dead to sin. We know that wrong is wrong. We know what we do with sin. We give it over to Jesus. And there's motivation then to turn away from Christ that we might give witness and give hope to the hope that we have. So, I mean, if you're, if you're struggling with this idea of being dead to sin after reading this, I encourage you to take Paul's command about mm -hmm. being reckoned and just do it and just do the things that... that uh, that we're called to do. I want to I want to read uh, Ephesians chapter 2. But we get to the idea of being dead to sin, what can we do? We turned away from sin. We've got to turn to Christ. What does that look like? Paul encourages us in Philippians 4:8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. That's what it looks like to be dead to sin. That's one of the finest verses in all of Scripture, the Philippians verse. Um, I think we're done today. Thank you for coming here. We're going to have a quick word of prayer, and then you can um, um, have a, a good Lord's Day. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for Wes, who was here to, to uh, speak, and to, uh, for Eric as he works the 
equipment, and I thank you for these two men and bless them and their families and, and watch over them. And, and I pray now for this, um, this time of the COVID-19, and I pray that you would take the fear away. And Father, just uh, help us to, to know each one that, um, that you are in command and you know the destiny of all. And Father, our destiny is so good. Our destiny is so good, whether we die or whether we live. As Paul said, um, whether we die or whether we live, I, it's, it's gonna be better if I die, he said. So, Father, I thank you for, for all your goodness to us and all the promises that you've given to us. Thank you for this church, and I pray that you'd bless it. And, uh, and now we just pray for your blessing on, on this evening. In thy name we pray, amen. amen.